Good evening, six, 7 o'clock. We uh, call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Walk in periods. Anyone here for a walk in? Uh, seeing none. Next is the uh, vote of common deck license for the Oreo restaurant. I think I saw. There you are. I thought so. Why don't you just come up and. Yep, thank you. Very simple, it's sort of like last time. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. If, I, if I may, I just yep. picked up a couple copies of the menu for you here. Great, the thank you. Menu. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Usually now, we get what are the champ? What are the changes? That's what I want to see. You know? <laughs> uh, How's this changing? Now, wait a minute. Well, we lobster on the menu now. Do you really? You can't have a restaurant in situ without lobster, right? That's right. <laughs> That's very true. Um, just to slowly. Uh, to go over Oro quickly. Um, so like if you oh. prefer. Um, Oro restaurant, obviously, in downtown Situate Harbor. Dinner only. Um, 65 seats. Uh, dinner only to start. Um, and really, what you have in front of you is a sample menu of the opening menu that you'll be featuring there. And really, the uh, focus and emphasis on the restaurant and food in general is local. Everything at your back door. Um, and really, you'll see a lot of the menus, uh, a lot of the menu items and ingredients reflect that. Island Creek oysters from Duxbury, lobsters out of Situate, um, tons of local purveyors right in the area. There's just so much here, you know. Um, so really, I just wanted to physically have something for you to sort of go over and yeah, make it, you hungry. So yep. do you have, like, uh, appetizers with you right so now? What so we're gonna <laughs> do is, I got some is that what you mean, or are yeah, you just saying that we have to water? Oh. <laughs> um, once again, now this is a sample menu. Um, I, you know, may do a couple small things. Um, uh, we are actually uh, toying with the notion of doing sort of a small bites page as well, uh, something sort of in the middle, um, and also some type of pub menu later on down the road. Opening date? Do you have a? I'm spot? shooting for the middle of February right now. Good. Um, at the earliest, mid February. At the latest, March first, I'd say. Good, good um, for you. No one wants to be open more than me, so yeah, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting sure. there. We really are. It's it's it's, it's come along. Good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Motion. Sure. Move that the uh, Board of Selectmen vote to grant a common vicular's license for Oral Restaurant LLC at 162 Front Street. Second. Second. Yep. Uh, further discussion from the board, from the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck. Yeah, good, good luck. luck. Happy holidays. Look, look forward to seeing you open. Thank you. Have a great holiday. You too. The uh, next item uh, is an Eagle Scout project that I just thought is Shane here. This Shane is here, right? Yes. And Paul Sherry. Shane, why don't you come up? Paul, why don't you come up to also? Come up to the front here. And Shane, why don't you just explain to us what, what you did? And uh, Yep, absolutely. All yours. Okay, um, so I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, um, there have been five uh, white bulletin signs at the sports fields around Situate. Um, at Central Field, there are two, both for the mix of softball and soccer, because both seasons intermingle with one another. And what would, there is one at Hadley School, because of the brand new soccer field there, as we all know. Um, there's one behind the middle school, uh, uh, Gates Middle School, which is for baseball and soccer again, is, and tennis actually. Soccer is just everywhere in this town. And um, the la there, yep. And so, back so, oh, in the back, back of the Situate High School, uh, by the JV field, by the Memorial Garden. Mm -hmm. And so, what I plan to do with those, and what is actually being put into effect now was because I've been working with the Situate Youth Center for six years now, and I've done work with the Rec Center for two to three years. And so um, what I wanted to do was make everything easier on everybody, because I've been calling people for years, um, calling, oh, we're on this date, and these kids got to be here in this time, and then by the next day, you've had 40, 50 messages on your phone going, so where am I supposed to be? Where am I going? How am I supposed to get here? Like, who's my coach, my team? And I just wanted to make it easier for everybody. So the main point of these signs was to put up the rosters and so everybody could learn where, put up scheduling, and also for other people that needed the sign. I know there is a um, gentleman softball league, which if they talked with me and or Jennifer from the rec center, we could get that into play. And there's just so many possibilities for these signs that 
it it's incredible. Like at first I was kind of like, okay, you know, they'll go up, but I've had people call me, ask me about it, like if they could use spacing or put something in. And I was I was greatly helped by everybody in this town. Everybody really helped me out. I mean, I have so many thank you letters that I have to send out that the post office is going to love me. I can say that much. But I just really wanted to get up and tell everybody that they're done, they're ready. If you have any questions, you can personally talk to me or Jennifer from the rec center or Mr. Sherry, and it's just up and ready to go. And I just wanted everybody to know. <coughs> Thank you. I, you know, I just thought it'd be it, it's a good thing to have somebody like Shane come in, you know, tell us something good for a change. Uh, we how often we hear bad things and. Uh, so when I first heard of this project, I was, you know, very enthused about it, enthused about him and, and the project, recognizing that this happens a lot. I mean, there are a lot of people who do a lot of things just unrecognized, and, and they go do it, whether it be for an Eagle Scout ceremony, for, for some, or, or they just do it uh, to help the town. So that was the, my main reason for having you in tonight, just to recognize you. And Paul, anything? Yeah, I'd just like to, you know, from the Recreation Department standpoint, I'd like to thank Shane just to let everybody know that um, he went out and busted his hump. I don't know if you've seen these uh, yet, if you have a chance to run by one of the fields. They, he took the design of one that we had, an old one that we had out there. He took that design. He kind of put his own touches on it. He went out, did all the leg work. He raised all the money himself, went to all the businesses uh, down the harbor. I mean, he, he's the one that did all the work. You know, he did a great job. He put these things together. He put them up. He, he, you know, they're all up nice and secure. Great, you know, visibility standpoint. Everybody will be able to see them as they enter the fields. And from our perspective, as far as uh, what we'll use them for, is, is as, as he said, we're going to monthly calendars will go up on those inside those boards so that people will have an idea. You know, transition from one time from one group to another on the fields is always an issue. This is going to help us out a lot because if somebody has a question as to what time they should be there, what time they should be getting onto the field, we now have a reference point for all of these people that, um, you know, from our perspective is going to be a great thing because it, it will help everybody out. They'll uh, have a perfect understanding of when they're supposed to be on the field, when they're supposed to be off the field. And we're hoping, you know, that these will really help from a transitional standpoint uh, from the, on the field. So, but as I said, he did all the work. He did all the legwork, he raised all the money, he, he went out, bought all his materials, he put it all together, and he, uh, he attached all the signs. So, I mean, I can't say anything else other than it was a great job. Thanks. Thank you, the board. <laughs> uh, just, just one quick question, is this yeah. the last project you have to do before you get your Eagle Scout? Uh, yes, this was my uh, official Eagle project. That's quite an achievement. It's, it's, That's well, I'm, in my opinion, I'm not the only one that should be here, in my opinion, because two of my best friends who have done scouting with me since I was I don't even remember how young. Um, they also just finished their two Eagle projects, um, Czech Cella and Pat Nornex, and they also motivated me to get everything out of the way, and they, they helped me every step of the way. And my friend Josh Bowd is finishing his too, so I mean, we're all pushing to really get this done. So they also deserve a, rec uh, a reference, and or they should be here in my opinion. Well, you just made a reference. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they get that. Well, I believe they deserve it. I'm Shane, sure they do. That's very selfish, selfless of you oh, to, to you. say. <laughs> okay. um, my point, my point is, is that you know what you've accomplished and what you've attempted to do um, is is certainly a, a public community investment. And you. you know you're doing it now at your age, but you know, frankly, I hope you carry that on forward in your community. Yeah. And if you stay in situate, which I hope you do. Um, it, it, it's very helpful to have people such as yourself as the example. Whatever community you end up in, the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, I hope you do the same because, Thank frankly, you. the investment you, you, you lend to your community is invaluable. And whether it's in that capacity or another capacity, or as Mr. Uh, um, you know, Paul does next to you, um, it's, it's invaluable. So I hope you, you take that lesson going forward, and I think you're more than honored and, and, and frankly, um, you've, you've demonstrated that award. Obviously, we don't lend that award. We don't give you that award, no, but I, I think know. you've demonstrated that, and I commend you for it. Thank you. I appreciate it. It means a lot to me to hear from all of you that you're all for it. It, it just means a lot. <laughs> Great. Anything else? Thank you. No, thank, thank you, you both. Thank you. Uh, happy holidays to both of you. Too, <laughs>
first out of a going to be a long process, I guess. Hopefully, a successful process. Uh, budgets and uh, it's as many of you know, we know that it's been a very uh, extensive process for the past month or so, town administrator, with department heads, and uh, I certainly won't steal any of her thunder, but Trish, it's all yours. No, it's all yours. <coughs> I know, it's all ours, probably, yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks. I asked Joe um, for a little time um, before you get into reviewing the departmental agenda um, um, budget submissions just to sort of give you an overview because as he mentioned it's it's probably a little different than you've seen in the past in terms of the, not only the budget document but the way the departmental budgets are presented to you. Um, as you know and we've been talking about we sort of retooled the budget document and the, the budget you see isn't just numbers now its goals and objectives. So I hope as you begin to review the budgets over the next three months, you really look at the goals and objectives. Um, I can't say enough good things about the staff here. Um, and I think I, I talked a little bit about it in the budget message, um, which sort of highlights the overarching sort of themes and financial challenges and major reductions in this proposed budget. But um, folks really stepped up to the plate and really worked hard on their goals and objectives. If they served a board or committee, they, um, they talked with them about it. I reviewed it with them. Um, and and I, 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 they did a tremendous job, and I can't say enough good things about that. Um, the main thing about this budget is um, the department head was responsible for prioritizing all the program services and activities that that department performs. So in terms of the priorities that they set, they knew that the priority that they made 10th of 11th would be or could be a target for reduction when I reviewed their budget in terms of what they thought was essential, non-essential, whatever. Um, and as you can see, there were some really difficult choices to make. The budget that you have before you is a balanced budget as required by law. Um, so for every corresponding uh, increase or um, um, support to put something back in the budget that the board or the advisory committee is inclined to do. There needs to be a corresponding decrease someplace else in the budget or a way to raise revenue. Um, a lot of these recommended reductions were not easy. Most of them were not. Um, and there's certainly an opportunity for additional conversation as we go forward on the way to, to March. But um, we have very difficult um, financial challenges ahead of us, and a lot of them are big question marks at this point. Financial forecasting met last week, and we were just even trying to get our arms around a couple of projections in terms of local aid and other local receipts, um, building growth that, um, that are really challenging us. So um, with that, I'll just uh, be happy to answer any questions or let you start to get into it. Well, you know, it's uh, what we'd like to do probably, keeping in mind that, uh, that this year we're not going to be voting the budgets uh, as we see them tonight. We're just going to review the budgets, look at them, uh, listen to any explanations that Christian might have of questions that we might have. Uh, sometime in February, depending upon the fluctuations that, that come in in the next couple of months, the additions, local aid, cuts of local aid, readjustments of... Uh, anticipated revenues one way or the other, uh, up or down. These numbers are liable to change, and some things that are here tonight uh, may not be here in town meeting. Conversely, some things that have been taken out of the, the, the requests uh, of the departments may be in the budget if, if things go in a, in a better direction. So it's really, we don't know uh, what the end result will be. So we're not going to vote these budgets tonight. We're going to look at them. If we have any things that we'd like to ask Trisha to go back and, and uh, take another look at, we can do that. <coughs> all right, so let's start with the first one on the agenda. I just make one, yep. one quick Absolutely. comment. I, you know, I want to thank, all, we had a forecasting meeting Tuesday night and got all the parties involved. I think there were probably 10 people in the room, school committee, advisory committee. Steve was there, Mary was there, Paul Donlin, and we went over all the assumptions that make up the, the um, split between the town and the school. I was thinking that may be a document that we want to put in here. Um, 
just to show that the, the total equals what how we got to that assumption of the split. So, um, and just from my own point of view, before we get started, this is an extremely impressive document, um, and it it just blows away the the past information that we've had available and the process that, that, that I know Trish has gone through to get to this point um, was a, a boatload of work. So uh, not only did all your staff do a great job, but you did a great job as well. Um, the other thing that's impressive, as Joe alluded to there, we're going into the budget knowing that it's balanced. So it's not this piecemeal thing that sometimes has happened in the past where you, know, you really can't vote on one because you don't know if the total equals what, what you have to be beneath. So I think there's, there's just a number of steps forward on this. It's a lot of material to digest. Um, as I'm sure the four of us can attest to, but um, but it's definitely definitely leaps in the right direction. So, you know, thank you for all your work, and and I'll get that document to you. Maybe we can put that yeah. in it to show that how we got to the point that the 13. Some of the sources and uses that new form that Mary did on it, and the backside's got the split, but we're going to refine it even more. Right. So. Right. Great. The first one. Uh, the first one is the advisory uh, committee budget. Uh, every few changes. Yep. Are we supposed to open the warrant first? Is that, I didn't see this. You get the agenda there? No, that's not. No. That's not till the, the next agenda budget. item. We're all set. I think that's that's next. Okay. That's later. Uh, the advisory committee's budget. It's a small budget. I think it's three. $5,300. Basically, Trisha, I guess it's, it's memberships and uh, items like that. Would that be safe to say? Yep, and Scott and Bob are here. So yeah. The majority of it is just printing the booklet. Yeah, it? the booklet and nothing out of the ordinary. The yep, that's the, the bulk of it. Yep. Any questions on the advisory board? I but, yep. I just noticed that it went down. Are you? Are we going to... Are we relying more online for people to get the booklet online as opposed to printed copies? <coughs> like the printing went from 4,000 something to 3,000. And I'm not quite sure why that went that way. I think in the past we've had so many leftover copies coming from, again, the attendance that this year I think we'll be a little bit more in line with what the attendance will be used for the meeting. Right. And it's I, always available online. Right. I think a lot of people are getting it that way. That was really the only Next is the uh, reserve fund. Any other questions on the uh, advisory board? The next is, is the reserve fund, which is ninety thousand dollars for ninety thousand years, I think. Uh, and it's the same again. Again, the adver the, the uh, reserve fund. Very simply, is this amount of money that that is uh, handled by the advisory board and is used for Emergency, emergency situations, non-budgeted situations that come up in the course of the year, some extraordinary expense that, that we didn't figure on, that town administrator uh, wasn't aware of, whether it be a result of a legal action or a storm or whatever, and the advisory fund is this $90,000 that we keep, uh, which allows us to, to deal with the bills that that extraordinary situation might represent. Any questions on the advisory on the ninety thousand dollars? No. Nope. And if it just just if it doesn't get spent, it goes back to it gets allocated <coughs> to another expense account like snow and ice or something at the end of the year. Uh, the next one is the the uh, assessors department. Steve is here. Thank you. What? Hold on. What number is that? That is. You know. I'm sorry. I. There aren't numbers. Just as a suggestion, but I did to make it to make it a lot easier. I, I took the uh, sections that we're going to deal with tonight out of the book, and it just makes it easier. It makes it a lot easier. Take my word for it. I don't usually do smart things like that, but this is <laughs> this is one that I did do. It's uh, two oh one one the assessment budget. You know, Steve, I'm going to do just something a little different tonight. Do you have the, you know, I do. Yeah. Would you just mind reading the mission statement? I'm going to try to do this for every department as they come in, just so everyone has an idea. Uh, we all know what the Board of Assessors do, we think. 
but maybe we don't. So if you, would, if you wouldn't mind just, just taking us a moment just to read that mission statement. The mission statement, the assessor's office is responsible for the administration of all laws and regulations regarding property tax assessments. In accordance with Massachusetts General Law and Department of Revenue Guidelines, the office administers evaluation of real estate, personal property, motor vehicle, and boat excise. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. I'm going to start by asking just one question. I think this is probably going to be the most trying period of time that I can remember for the Board of Assessors, only because of the values uh, <clears throat> of homes that have gone down so dramatically in the past year or two. Uh, people who think who are being attacked at a home valued at $500,000 uh, just try to sell it for 400000 and couldn't. So, you know, the first avenue of, of uh, complaint, I guess, is to go to you and say, look, I'm paying taxes on $500,000. I can't get it. What, if anything, how do you, as a department, um, how do you perceive dealing with this? Uh, well, assessments are always historical numbers. Yeah. The number we see today is not what the, the property is worth today. In other words, when you get your tax bill in December, it's a value that's essentially 12 months old. So it's always behind the, the time or behind the curve. In an increasing market, people weren't too concerned about that. But when now things have turned the other direction, they obviously are. But Department of Revenue re requires us to do what they call interim adjustments each year. You know, we do a revaluation every third year, but we just can't sit on our hands. We have to do adjustments based on the market conditions of the prior 12 months. So again, when we do assessments in December, when they come out in two weeks or three weeks, they're based on calendar year 2008 transfers that took place during that study period, not what, what took place a month ago or two months ago, or even 10 months ago. So people have to realize always that it's always a historical number and that it's, there's always a lapse in time of the assessment versus the current data. So wouldn't 2008 be just as bad as 2009 in the... In the no, in it the wasn't actually. Case? Wasn't it really? No, no. We're, we're going to see some decrease. <coughs> pretty much a lot of decreases in town for valuations and assessments, but the 09 market is worse than the 08 market. So that will be found out in 2010. 2000, so that people understand that... 2011 will be when they see the 2009 in an, transfers. In an up market, if you are valuating property a year before, obviously the value of property a year ahead is going to be a lot more, but you're not going to get taxed on that number. You're gonna, correct. A 10% or in some instances 25% if it was along the water, for example, or something. So you said it was based on a transfer. It's based on the transaction from yes, the from 2008. Right, but the, a real estate transaction. And that's not us. That's that's mm -hmm. the Commonwealth, and that's the where the Department of Revenue determines the guidelines and the, and the laws and so forth. So we will see we'll see decreases this year. But again, when I you get a tax bill in December and it says X, I won't disagree that it may not be worth that. But it was worth that 12 months ago mm -hmm. in theory. And that affects your assessment though going forward though because. There is some kind of like relationship between obviously a decrease in value, but the tax dollars may go up to some degree. The well, tax rate's changing, of yeah. course. Yeah. So people may see that. In other words, the change in the tax rate. <clears throat> it depends where you where you sit in, in the in the adjustment. In other words, if you're at a certain percentage, your tax your tax bill will increase, of course. And if you if you're lower than that, it will it may stay flat or may go down. Even in in, in a non reval year, it may be a thing where some go up, some go down, some to the same. It just, it just happens that the numbers get, get adjusted, the levy. But the important thing to know is that the, the pool, the body of all of it, right. goes up 2.5%. Right. So there's little tweakings here and there, but, if, you know, the water's always level. So whatever you're taking from one assessment goes down, it's either being corrected with the rate or with somebody else's value and, and, going up. And from the sales analysis in 2008, we saw some neighborhoods had to be adjusted significantly. There's some, some changes that have to occur, or a, or a style of home or a, 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 an older home versus a newer home, just from whatever that sales information told us in 2008. Um, so that's what ends, ends, up, ends up happening. People will see a number in, in two weeks that they will maybe disagree with, and we understand that. Mm -hmm. But it's our job to educate them that it's not today, it's 12 months ago. So, so they're hard numbers, they're not opinions, any, any no, real no, it's, it's, right. this is a thorough analysis right. that we have to submit to the Department of Revenue each year. <clears throat> and if you don't meet those guidelines, you don't get certified, you don't get tax rate approved. Steve, one question. For, if someone comes in for an abatement, 
Do you always have to go back to that year? I mean, so people should know when they come to an abatement, they shouldn't come looking at who's what their neighbor's house sold for yesterday, exactly. because that's just not data exactly. that you're going to you're going to take into account. You know, current current information is helpful to look at a time adjustment, perhaps back to just to, to, of January of last year. But the the, the analysis process period we had to use was the 2008 market. So if somebody walks in again and says a house next door sold, but what did the house down the street from you sell in 2008? And there, right. there's, there's, a, there's the data. It's not current. I mean, current information, obviously, if it's so <coughs> far off that it's off by $200,000, then maybe there's something that we don't know about. But mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's off by a reasonable amount over a 12-month 12 12 period, then it makes sense. And, and those adjustments though, that you're talking about, Tony, is something that they have to take into play for next year Correct. for the abatement. So if in the event that they feel that they're being slighted because this year there's a difference, wait until next year to, to abate it to go back, if that's the case. It right. could turn and, around and, and, and go and up, interim, too. We, we may make an adjustment next exactly. December based on the 2009 market that you're talking about. If, if we see that, in fact, that they have to be adjusted another whatever percentage, that'll happen. Uh, anticipating, I guess, uh, more, more requests for abatements probably than you've had in the past, again, because of the... Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, have you increased your overlay reserve? And will you maybe explain what the overlay reserve is? The overlay is, is the amount set aside for abatements and exemptions. Although mm -hmm. typically it's mostly exemptions. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the statutory exemptions for veterans and for elderly and for surviving spouse and those kind of things. The abatements generally don't make up the, the major part of that. Okay. Recently they have. Last year was a revaluation year, so we had some higher numbers. Um, the overlay was not increased this year for fiscal year uh, 11 going forward. Um, or Do you think 10. that's wise, given the current um, climate? I'm, I'm not trying to, right, right, oh, I, but I'm saying that looking forward now, I mean, there could be somewhat of a, I don't want to say a deluge, true. but I mean a, a number of people who say, hey, look, I want to reevaluate because we're not looking at an annual, we're looking at more of like the market adjustment that you're talking about. And does it make sense right. to think about maybe increasing the overlay because there may be more? By the time we end, well, typically January. we've had a reserve left over the years, even in the re other reval years. Although this is the first, this year and last year, perhaps the first time we're seeing this recent thing decreases. Um, that certainly would be something we look to toward next year. Mm -hmm. Certainly, increasing the overlay if that if that's if it's if it's a possibility. I don't think historically that we have. I think the number that we set has always been enough. And like yeah. Steve said, whatever you don't use in that year, you know it. it is there to be used in different ways? No, I, I, I agree. I don't, I'm only saying because of the recent change in the market and maybe the, the significant drop in valuations of properties that my antici uh, what I anticipate this year and next year is that there will be more abatements. Um, and, or and, more you know, filings. Or more filings, rather. Okay. And whether that goes through the assessors or whether it goes up on the tax appeals board, uh, that's my right. concern, exactly. is that there may be more people who will say, hey, look, um, there is a significant drop, and we don't have enough in the overlay or overlay to, to address it. Um, anyway, that's the one thing, because this is a unique market by comparison the past 30 to maybe even 70 years. I know. 27th or 8th year, I've never seen this. You're young. Don't worry. <laughs> Further questions for the board? The only other thing I saw was that you had provided us, or actually, um, Tricia, probably, or you did, Steve, the uh, benchmark to the surrounding communities of your budget. And obviously, you come in six out of eight. So your budget is certainly well within conforming to the request of surrounding communities. And I'm talking about surrounding communities. So um, I commend both of you for, for doing uh, doing that for Situate. Thank you, Steve. I don't know if you just want to take a sec. Just yep. so we go through what the budget is, is made up of. Yep. For the people at home and in the audience. So for the assessor's budget, he's he's filled out his mission. We've got a list of a number of goals here that he has to accomplish. His his risks and challenges, his major budget components, um, departmental accomplishments, then any sort of revenue field or funds. He's, we've got detail on that. We've got budget priorities, which Trisha alluded to before. Benchmarks, so what all of our surrounding town, uh, neighbors, what their assessor's departments are, how many people, what their budget is, um, and their budget, and then just line by line items of the budget. So that every one of these departments is quite extensive in terms of 
the information that's been gathered and the information that's available to us. So um, I don't think we'll go through all of it and every one, but just so you know what we're looking at here, it's a lot of info. It, it really is. It's a, it's a, it's it's a primer, I think, for for anyone entering public service in, in the town of Situate. If, if you wanted to know um, what it's all about, this document, although it's a budget document, really clearly and in, 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 in a great way just outlines, as Tony just said, I mean, everything, uh, goals, objectives, uh, risks, uh, you know, anything you possibly ever want to know about what they do, the mission statement, what that department does, uh, it's just a, it's a great, great work. And uh, Well, from the personal thing, the benchmark was something that I'm glad we were yeah. able to bring forth because, well, we knew that for many years, but it was something that we could manage and it worked. Yep. Um, the numbers we revealed. What we that was a lot. It says a lot. And I think if, as we go through these budgets, I, I think we're going to see in all of them exactly what we saw. I know I... The accountants, I, the ones we dealt with, uh, dealing with tonight, I did go through, and they're all the same. I mean, in comparison to other cities and towns in our immediate area, we are doing a lot with fewer people than most of them. So, Tony brought that, that out. That's what Steve's alluding to. Yeah. You know, in in the assessors, it tells the amount of the budget, how many parcels are in that community, and how many people are in staffing these yep. departments. And when you look at Situate compared to Duxbury, Marshfield, Hingham. Oh, Hanover, Hanover, Abington, and Pembroke. Abington, yeah. You see the comparison of what we get done compared to other communities, and at the cost, it's it's quite remarkable how well we're yep. running our departments. Yep. yep. John and Tricia, the department heads did all this, right? I I know you thanked them, but I know it was a lot of work, and we all appreciate it. Oh, all of <laughs> it was a new process. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's, all, it's, 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 yeah, it's a lot of work. And it, it may be a new process, but I mean, the reality is, and you know, Tony hit on it earlier, and we all have. I mean, um, you know, it goes back to, you know, you, you <coughs> asked the question, Mr. Chairman, about, you know, um, any questions. And first off, balance budget, number one, Tricia, and number two, I don't have any questions after looking at this right now. And, and that's something that is very helpful for us as, as Board of Selectmen. Obviously, Tricia, thank you, but it comes to the department head. Steve, you're sitting in front of us. Every department head comes before us the same thing, and I have to say that it's a, it's a cooperative partnership, and, and frankly, that's helpful for not just us. Frankly, it's the town. That's the bottom line. So thank you. Appreciate it. Further questions from the board? Steve, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Bernice, I think. How are you tonight? Good, good. Now, yeah. I had um, questions of the clerk, though. <laughs> I was kidding. No, 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 just kidding, Bernice. <laughs> and I think it All right, I could have handled them. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a minute while everyone gets the clerk's budget out. What number is that one? That is uh, 2011. It's one, two, it's the third one down from the last one we had. Blue sheets. Cable. <clears throat> Again, Brittany, if you would just, uh, as, like, as I said, we're going to ask everyone to do this, I think it's, to read that mission statement, mm -hmm. just to give us and everybody else an idea of exactly what the town clerk's office is about. The mission of the office of the town clerk is to serve as the official record keeper and archivist of the town records and statistics, and to coordinate and oversee elections and voter registration in compliance with Massachusetts and local law in order to assure sound documentation and access to local government for, gen for the general public and town government. To accurately establish, maintain, and certify all vital statistics of the town and to collect and administer licenses, registrations, and permits required by Massachusetts general laws and town bylaws. To provide courteous, confident, and efficient service to the community in an effort to establish public confidence and respect for government. Thank you. As Tony alluded to, there is, there is so much more in these uh, budget packets for the individual departments than, than maybe I do it justice. It's, it's, uh, 
its goals, its observations, its, its, uh, how to improve efficiency, uh, how to increase license revenue, and, and just it goes on and on. Again, the, the peer comparisons to other towns, uh, and then once again it shows us, and I won't use the word understaffed, but it shows us certainly faring very, very well in comparison to other towns when it comes to personnel. Uh, we all know that the, you know, we all deal with the town clerk's office at one time or another in our lives, and uh, you just can't say enough about it. Uh, any questions from the board or comments from the board? Uh, just the one, again, just so that people understand that the town clerk in our town is, based on the surrounding towns out of 12, uh, ranks 10th out of 12 surrounding communities. So, again, just to show that, you know. In terms of what? Um, when we're talking <laughs> about salary. Of, in, in, in terms everything. of salary, not in terms yeah. of... But I'm trying to give a sense of... <laughs> we're number one. Well, in oh, <laughs> correct. And please forgive me, Bernice. That's exactly what I was just saying. That In other words, the town is very lucky and fortunate to be able to have such somebody who's able... Uh, somebody such as Bernice and, and prior ones to be efficient and effective, and yet we rank lowest in the pay scale. So the town's getting a lot of proverbial bang for its buck. I, I obviously wish it were higher, but I'm saying that, you know, frankly, the town should be very proud of that, Bernice. So. Um, thank you, Tony, for at least clarifying it. I wasn't going down that road. <laughs> Believe me, Bernice, I wasn't. The only question I had on the budget, if I could jump in, is that, and I, I think I know the answer, or you know what, I don't know if I know the answer. Um, the overtime in for 2011 is, is about $5,000. And although I did see all the, the detail that breaks it out, which is quite impressive by person, by election, by... Um, but that, where was that last year? Because I don't see... We were, we were asked not to include it in overtime and, and to just see what we could incorporate into our salaries. And um, so it was, it, was, it was there, but it was, that money was there broken out exactly the same way you're seeing it now, but it, we were asked not to put it in as overtime. Some of it, the money's still there. It's just you'll see several line items that look like they've been zeroed out and never had an appropriation. Right. But that's because we're following budget sense and the chart of accounts more accurately than we have before relative to services. So that, that's why you're seeing that. It's not a new appropriation. It's just in another line item or later on, especially when you get to purchase of services or office supplies. Those zeros all the way across doesn't mean it's a new request by the department head we're better mm -hmm. accounting for it. Right. But if you look at the total of the two, you know, it equals about 121,000 this year, where last year, where we only appropriated 112 last year, and the year before that we only expended 116. So is that something that was, was paid with comp time or something in the past, or was it, is it incorporated in that 116? That, that 116, incorporated um, our overtime and the overtime is really only paid to the assistant town clerk right. and and to the records clerk who work in the office those are all election related and they all appeared in the the final amount broken out just as you see it mm -hmm. yeah Brady, how much is it effect is that there's a special election like the one that's coming up next month have that of course would increase everything uh, overtime and election workers and it will increase over time um, there isn't any way you can run an election out of the clerk's office with two and a half people without having overtime mm -hmm. we do not have overtime in the sense that we, we work an extra we come in an extra day or an extra half day that overtime is totally related to the time the election runs <coughs> whether it runs beyond the 35 hours a week that a staffer would have been working, then we run into overtime. We do not run into overtime or anything more than what it takes to run the election. And remember that Saturday elections, when we run a Saturday election, is going to be a full day. But in terms of the special, yes, it's, it's added to overtime. We have two elections that we have to run with we didn't anticipate running, and we are doing some of it with comp time, mm -hmm. and we're doing a very small amount of it. Now, is that a state, is that considered a state mandate? State mandate is 
supposedly anything the state mandates, uh, the state pays for. Um, now, we know that doesn't happen, but does this fall into that category? The auditor has considered this an unfunded mandate. He has let the legislature know that that's how he views this. The legislature is in turn planning on setting aside $15 million to cover the cost of these elections. If that were to occur and we were actually to be funded, that would take care of all of the additional operation that we have handled in the office as well. Mm -hmm. Because every election requires probably two months to put together and, and all of that time in the office that was not anticipated being, we have been crunching. Um, but whether or not that will ever actually be funded, we don't. It behooves us as, as, as we see our elected representatives here in this room and other places to, to continue to ask them to fund stuff, Absolutely. things like this. Thank you. I, uh, John? I, and again, Bernice, forgive me. Um, I noticed from the appropriations from last year, there's like 128 is what was um, designated for fiscal year this year, and yet appropriated or at least expended to date is 47. What's the discrepancy? What's the difference? Uh, what we, am I missing there? We end up using money at different times of the year. Okay. Our census hasn't come in, the, the funding for the census. We haven't spent that yet. We haven't spent the postage for the census. We haven't spent for the town meeting. We haven't spent for the town election. Okay. All of those things will be there. All right. uh, Mary, can I, uh, what is the, when you say year to date, what month is that through? Oh, it'll probably be the date the report was printed, so. December 9th. Yeah, I don't know what, what date. You think it actually? At the bottom of the page on the report, December 9th. December 9th. So December 9th, the totals are in there through that. We almost always do less expenditure in the fall. It's the, it, you back end it. In other words, between the, the last six months is when you, generally the costs come in. That's all I just want to find yeah. out. Bernice, are there more elections in fiscal year 2011 than 10? Aren't there more this year? 2010, we've ended up with, Three. it's always hard to back into the No, you're going to have the uh, state elections. 2010, we'll have one state election. We will have one town election, and we will have a town meeting. And you have primary, too. So, and a, right, and the primary. Yeah. So two, we just state. had one. We had. We had the primary, and then we'll have we the. We had the primary. We'll have another state election. Right. In January. We will have the, the town. town meeting in April. We will have the town election in May. Right. So in 2011, we're probably going to have. Two and two. Two and. Two more? You're going to have state primary in September you have a state um, actually you have an interim because it's to it's the interim year both congressionally as well federally and also state no, same. and then you'll have town meeting and you'll have a town election in, in 2011 okay. you know this, in the spring so the one that throws it off is really the presidential one when that yes. yeah it's just I don't know Trish if I assume that's right where we only appropriated 112 last year and this year it's 121 it seems like we'll probably be under this year or over this year. Uh, further questions or comments from the board? If not. But could I make a comment? You sure could. Um, somewhat uncomfortably, I'm going to bring up the question of comp compensation that came up earlier, um, beginning knowing fully what the state of affairs happens to be in terms of money. And, and really wanting you all to know I'm very happy with my job and very pleased to have it. Um, one of the things I observed when we began this budget process was for the very first time I saw the compensation of other department heads in the town. I was quite astonished to find that as a department head my compensation is significantly lower than everyone else's. I, I don't understand the reason for that, and, and I would love to hear what the reason is if someone happens to know at this point, but that isn't even my major issue. My real issue with the compensation is the town clerk salary is a salary that's, that's voted in a separate article from the way all of the rest of the budget is done. And it would be my assumption that, because certainly it's the way I assume it, is that when the number is given to town meeting, 
as being the salary that's suggested as being the compensation for the coming year for the town clerk. That it is expected that it is in line with the rest of the department managers. And I think that means that the majority of people who vote on the town clerk salary vote on the top town clerk salary with inadequate information. Um, they really don't know the compensation of the other department heads. And they are voting on the town clerk salary in something of a vacuum. Um, they don't know where that stands. They don't know whether or not they would rather compensate me $5,000 less or whether or not, in fact, I am deserving of being compensated more. And in this particular case, it's not a matter of deserving in the sense of, of work, but deserving in the sense of the professional status, I believe, of the position of town clerk. And I, I really do think it's worth the townspeople being aware that they're voting in that vacuum. And I think it would be interesting to know whether or not there is a specific reason why the town clerk position is as undercompensated as it is. Well, I think uh, it's a question that probably can't be answered tonight because I don't get the. I don't think any of us have statistics in front of us to to, to argue one way or the other, uh, whether it's under underpaid or not. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. working your assumption that it is. Yes. Your uh, why does it happen? Uh, I don't know. I think over the years, uh, the town clerk has. Periodic, it periodically been attempted to be brought up over the years. I think it started out years ago at very low, and, and yeah, very low. I mean, it's probably come uh, a long way, even though it may still be uh, under salary. It's come a long way from the way it was 20 years ago. It's just probably just uh, taken longer to get up to, to, to pie if, if, in fact, it is under. I don't think there's any deliberate, you know, and I don't think you do either. Yeah. attempt to, you know, keep the town clerk's salary. I think it's something. I think, in fact, my own position is that, to some extent, it is an anomaly. Because it is the only uh, salary that is voted in the way it's voted, yeah. I think it's very easy to let it slip through and have it never really quite catch up because it doesn't really come under the same umbrella everything else does. Um, I mention it because I think it's fair for voters to be aware of this. I think it's fair to the position for it to be considered. Um, not necessarily this year, maybe not next year, because I know what the budget positions are. But there should really be a very clear reason for this. And I think at some level, the general public should really know exactly what it is they're voting for and where it fits. Thank you. Yeah, only a couple points I did. I mean, obviously, it's elected position. Yes. So that's why it's separate. You know, oh, that, right, yes. so that's why it's its own article. Yes. Um, I think, I know that at least for the last eight years, you know, that percentage increases have been comparable, you know, between between people across the board. But I think Joe may have hit the nail on the head when he said, if you started a really no number, you know, going up 3% a year, you know, it's, it's hard to make up a, a delta of someone else starting at a higher base. But the one thing I will say is, Tricia, put it very, very clearly in her opinion in this that um, that it is something that needs to be looked at and that it is an obvious, um, you know, um, what's the right word, uh, um, lower fee than what the surrounding towns are and what, what the other um, positions in town are. I appreciate are. Trish yeah. doing that, yeah. and, and that's certainly true. Um, it is unfortunate also that it, it was frozen last year. So... You know, that in general has been a sense of exactly what is the position of the town clerk and, um, and how does the town see it in terms of its management responsibilities. I, I, On the I, surface, it would appear that the responsibilities are equivalent to any other department. And I think that's what we're trying to do with this whole process. I think it's to, to uh, show exactly what people do. and. and uh, Mm -hmm. Hopefully it'll pay off, John. Yeah, the only comment is I agree, and and frankly, if the financial times were different, I'd certainly say I think it's fair, fair game for the um, uh, town meeting and the, the electorate, the constituents to take a look at that. Um, 
and and you need not go farther than this board to find out its compensation, which is not much by comparison. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, you know, there are people who have this misconception that the Board of Selectmen are being paid thousands upon thousands of dollars for compensation, which You're is not. I wish. <laughs> uh, and, and somebody had said that I was getting paid. I was like, oh, no, yeah, I believe it. You know, so they need not look. And I'm not trying to um, in, in, um, dumb it down and try to inject the Board of Selectmen, but I'm saying it's similarly. I mean, same gripe. We take on a lot of responsibility. It's a different position than yours, I realize that, and I think that's a fair question you raised that the town should take a look at. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, Bernice, in these financial climate that this is the time to take a look at that issue because of our financial situation, but I think the question is fair that should be asked in the future, and I Tommy's would agree with you. Tommy's everything. I didn't consider it to be perfect, no, no. Tommy, I know. but I, I really did yeah. at some level consider it appropriate. I think that the, the, the most important factor that was brought out here tonight was by Tony when he said the town administrator in the budget has recognized that. Yes. and, and uh, has brought it to our attention, and she's aware of it, and we're aware of it. So that's hopefully. Yes, she has, and I really do appreciate ballot, it. So. I do want to emphasize that that was a cost of living increase that did not occur last year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barry. 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 What? Town accountant. Two zero one one. <clears throat> Is that back? Um, back. Yeah. Right in front of the assessor. One thirty. Right after the assessor. One thirty-five. Are they in order? See, just so that people understand, we don't have the numbers on these. So as we go through them, we're just having to go through it. I got it. There it is. It's two before the town clerks. I'm going if with you go to the blue pages. Oh, go my oh, yeah, the blue pages. It's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mary, if you would again, as others have done, uh, read the mission statement and we'll, we'll follow up from there. The mission of the town accountant's office is to protect, protect the fiduciary interests of the town by providing independent, timely oversight of the town's finances and by ensuring that financial transactions are executed legally, efficiently, and effectively in accordance with federal, state, and local law, as well as in adherence to generally accepted accounting principles. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, well aware that we've, we've got a, a great accounting department there, and, and, and uh, you know we're aware of the changes and everything that has to be done with the new new regulations and everything, and trying to keep up with it. I mean, on a limited budget and personnel is a challenge. I, I noticed one thing in your accomplishments. Um, <coughs> The first one, installation of human resources package to automate attendance records, keeping balances, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, I've always suspected that without anything, without any uh, uh, proof or that maybe that was a weak spot in, in our it, government. No, was it, no? No, it wasn't a weak spot. It was just, it was all manually, mostly manually done yeah. or with a hand-grown programs and it was very hard to get, keep it timely and, and making sure the department, what the departments had and what we had up in our office were in agreement. Uh -huh. So this is, this is helping to keep it that we're getting timely information so the balances are accurate. So the department head would turn into <laughs> you on a weekly or monthly or a daily? Right, every week with their payroll <coughs> and then all of a sudden you would, would submit the tell them what their balances were, and they'd have something different down in their office. So this is hopefully going to stop doing that. And once it comes, you know, up to us, that's it. That's the balance. It'll be the balance. It'll be correct. And they'll be able to, you know, one of my goals, my objective, objectives next year is uh, my assistant actually is working on making it so it's available to the departments so they can access right online to see their balances. Uh huh. Good. So that would no, you know, eliminate conflict. the back and forth, and yep. I've got six days, I've got eight days, that type yep, of thing. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. The board. One thing I noticed was, um, and it's a common theme with some of the other departments, is one of your challenges is is the IT area. Hmm. Um, and I wasn't surprised, but you know, it's probably not typical for an accounting department to spend so much time doing IT type functions. So, you know, 
hats off to you for really we don't have an IT department in, in the town right now I know that's another one of uh, the town administrators uh, you know short-term and long-term goals so um, you know we appreciate all the energy you do put into that um, that was one thing that stuck out to me technical services I see go up about 37 thousand but what is, is that the IT or what is the uh, technical no, services? No, actually we've moved the, um, the audit, the annual audit from the uh, town administrator's budget to the town accountant okay. since it's just more appropriate okay. since I pretty much oversee them and know when they're completed something. So okay. it's more appropriate in my budget. Now there's two audits. There's... You have your financial year, the annual financial audit. That's the $30,000 one. Yeah. And then there's the... Um, GASB 45 for the other post-employment benefits, employee benefits. We have to do it biannual every two years, an actuarial study, actually. So that has to be done every two years? Yes. Nothing good comes out of that audit. No, no just a higher number. <laughs> Questions from the board or comments? Um, I also noticed, which is again trending in some of them, that the conferences, I see you haven't gone to conferences in the past and you have over $2,000 in conferences. Well, actually, and you, it Was that moved, training? Yes, it was actually training. Right. It was moved from training down to conferences. But that's another thing that I know Trish is, is pushing people so that different layers of management get out and get to different conferences that can help them keep their oh, keep yes, up to speed on. Oh, yes, that's very I think it's great. I think any type of continuing education that could give you new trends and ideas mm -hmm. extremely helpful because it could give you an idea how to save money in the long term it does help <laughs> one other thing that I circled was the um, the ten thousand dollar capital expense yeah. to upgrade the uh, SQL, SQL server, server. Um, what is the software what what accounting package is it it's um, called budget sense it's from a company called Unifund they're out of New Hampshire. Is that also the general ledger and? It's the general it's ledger, our human resource package, and accounts payable package. And that's running on Sir, SQL 2000. SQL Server 2000, yeah, is yeah the backbone, and now um, Microsoft's no longer longer su supporting it after December 2010. Right. So we've got to upgrade that to SQL 2008. So that's an expensive. Questions from the board? Anything else? The only other thing I cir circled here, I didn't uh, know what I think I answered my own question with the last one. There is a stipend in here, which is for the IT. Yeah, which, yeah, which <laughs> I was so excited about doing my missions and goals and objectives. I inadvertently left that out. So I, hopefully at some point before you vote in February, we'll be able to come up with $2,600. So it's not in the budget. No, it will be, but she took it out. So she was, just she was overly optimistic that she'd be done with it. Yeah, I thought. I said, oh, but we're getting an IT and that was, <laughs> was that in there last year? Yes, it was. Yeah. It was in there last year. No. Is that a flat fee or is it based it's on any? It's $50 a week. $50 a week for you. You could add a zero after that, and it still wouldn't be enough <laughs> considering how much time it takes her. Yeah, it's, it's uh, is part of our challenge. It's Causes a lot of interruptions. That's all I circled. Thank you. Further for the board? Oh, almost. All right, Mary, thank you. All right, thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Happy thank holidays, you. Mary. You too. Uh, Laura. Planning. Planning board. You stand for box. A planning department, I should say, more than a planning board. Laura, would you again, like we're asking everyone if you'd read that mission statement? The mission of the Planning Board and Planning Department of the Town of Situate is the creation and implementation of long-range plans to provide coordinated guidance and regulation of physical growth and development through the review of subdivision and site development plans to explore and pursue grant opportunities for the town as directed by the town administrator and to provide professional advice and technical expertise on land development concerns to the citizens, elected officials, appointed boards and committees and other departments of the town situate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the board have any comments uh, on the planning planning department, I should say. 
outside of Laura, have you seen what the um, has the economic climate? I guess. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't give you did I give everyone enough time. Yeah. 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 Um, economic climate be what it is. Uh, if yes, if you see, does that seem to increase your workload or decrease your workload? Or does it make a difference? In some ways, it's decreased it, but in other ways, it seems like it's stayed the same or maybe even increased because. I think there's more financial pressure on everyone, so some people are trying um, maybe a little more desperately to develop a piece of land mm -hmm. that you know, still needs a lot of careful review. Um, and the other thing that I think may have increased the workload, or, or at least kept it the same, I should say, is that we finally are taking some time for some longer range projects like the zoning revision is underway right now, and the stormwater regulations, we're still um, looking at those. Um, we're looking at the zoning map in, in a lot of detail, and hopefully that's going to be coming to town meetings. So there are a lot of things that we're getting into and in, we're able to get into in more depth because there's a little more time. John? Would it, would it be safe to say yes, because it's very similar to the Board of Health? Yes, there are less projects, but the projects that are before you, more difficult ones, where 40 years ago or 20 years ago, developers would say, oh, there's ledge and there's a lot of issues with that, so they'd walk away. So now land is what it is and not making any more of it. So now here it is before you and there's a lot more obstacles to go over. Yeah. Pretty I, safe. Definitely. Yeah, I think the land that's left is tougher to develop. Right. The changes in Title V now mean that some land can be developed which could be developed before. Before, right. And it's, you know, it's not your prime land. It's land that's, you know, has a few, you know, problems. Right. Well, stormwater, on the other hand, was an issue that we told, we had suggested was an issue that should have been vetted out before going through everything, if I'm not mistaken, before town meeting. And obviously that's an issue that's still being vetted out because it's a lot of the, the proposed regulations or the, the bylaws aren't, aren't, shall we say, they're not worked out yet, correct? I think that's fair. And, and, and I know from being on the board when we suggested that we should hold off on doing it, not last this year but the year before, I think the thought process was let's hold off on doing it, let's get the bylaws down. And now they, they actually have created a lot more work because they've been problemat problematic both from the town as well as from trying to conform with the state regulations. I think that's one of the things that the board is taking a really close look at. All right. Thank you. Further comments, Tony? Well, one quick thing. I, I liked your goal and objective map, how it was time, you know, it's a timeline that shows what you hope to get by certain time periods. I thought that was, was interesting and obviously easy to, to track. Um, on the budget, it looks like a couple of years ago we took some full-time people and made them part-time. So we've got. Um, yeah, it's pretty much always been one full time, one part time position for. Oh, it was just in different days. line items back then. Um, but yeah, one, that's what it was. one question I had was uh, on technical services, and it may, I didn't see the details, but I mean, it's, it's going down considerably. Yes. And I didn't know if there was something that was coming out of that budget or if there was something that we weren't going to be doing. It's going from 7000 to 2600 That budget tends to be used for special projects. And it had been used for the zoning revision. The, the whole 7,000 was all going towards the zoning revision. Right. And now um, that's going to be done. And in there, at least for now, is $2,000 for um, looking at some changes to the language in the subdivision rules and regulations involving stormwater, which would involve getting a consultant to do the language instead of doing the language in-house because the science and some of the legal issues are really a little bit beyond what we can do in-house. So the zoning consultant that we got to look at the zoning bylaws has been will be completed by the end of this fiscal year? Yes. She should be. Yes, it will yeah, be. John's very you know, involved Good. with that. Great. That's been yeah, it, a long problem. time coming. <laughs> oh, yeah. I find it so interesting just as an aside that uh, We've had two budgets, two important budgets, information given in the last 10 or 15 minutes. But the reporters that were here, three of them, 
evidently found a better story out in the hall. <laughs> uh, you know, too bad we didn't have something dynamic to announce. Now. <laughs> we didn't have them miss it because they couldn't get out to the they couldn't get out to the hall fast enough to interview the town clerk. So evidently, nothing else that goes on in town is. Must be, a bit, must, be, must be a better story there, huh? Than if you mean that my budget is, is uh, No, yeah, but oh, yeah. It, 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 I don't think your budget is unimportant, but evidently uh, our friends of the reporters do, but that's a shame. No, I'm the same dynamic. Yeah. Just an interesting point that I noticed. So. Uh, further questions on Laura? No. Laura, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you very you much. much. And happy holidays, Laura. Thanks. Thank you. Same to you. Uh, the next two, Trisha, we're passing on. Am I correct? The inspections and uh, zoning board. Zoning board. Neil uh, ill today, so rather than you'll see him at your next meeting. Rather go through I it. I didn't get that email. Uh, you didn't get that one. No. I did. No, I didn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the last one is uh, what does walk, Bob? Uh, well, the enterprise funds, is it, Joe? Way in the back, yep. yeah. The first one. We're still golfing, I see. We are. Drive by every day, and I see people out there with golf course yeah. carts. The last week of it. Is it? Is it officially? Okay. Is this the, is this the latest you've gone into the December, or have you gone later? No, we always shoot for the, uh, the last Sunday before Christmas. We really shoot for that anyway, huh? Yeah, we make it more often than we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If it keeps being balmy and we're able to, are we going to keep it open or? Um, the dog walkers would be very upset with us. Uh, Kim's nodding. I am. <laughs> <laughs> that was so great. I just uh, want to say, um, Bob traditionally has not done a budget. And um, I have to say, he really stepped up to the plate. Yep. Um, Rick traditionally handled most of the revenue projections and the expenditures for carts and batteries and capital. And Bob has done it all this year, so um, really a new role for him. Thank you. Talking that you see uh, is a real testament to him, his learning curve, and I'm very proud of him. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, good job. Uh, you know, I think we all know the job you do up there. It's not a season goes by that someone doesn't stop me and, uh, and comment on, on Bob Sanderson, what a pleasure he is either to work with or deal with, et cetera. But having said that, uh, <laughs> let's see. I, uh, you mentioned in your uh, objectives, I think it's the, the, to, to, to upgrade, if not upgrade, that's my word, to uh, improve and enhance the food and beverage operation. Uh, we have a contract in there now for 10 years, I believe, right? Is he in the first or second year of that contract? It would be the first year of however many years. I never have I seen the contract. I think it's ten. First of five. Pardon? First of five. Yeah, five? Okay. five-year um, option. So you would like to work with Tricia and him to see what improvements can be made? Or? Yeah, I think maybe do some of what we've done here and just do some comparatives with some other operations. Uh, you know, I, price comparisons, everything else, I suppose. Um, yep. Yeah. You know what I forgot to do? Would you mind going over that mission statement? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Widow's Walk Golf Course endeavors to offer the best valued golf experience available on the South Shore by providing a well manicured championship course with friendly customer service. Situate residents are granted special policies and, prices, and pricing to encourage a high level of activity from our community members. It is the intent of this enterprise operation to offset all expenses through the collection of reasonable usage fees. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just, if I could just start it off, and I guess I'll cut to the, the meat of this. Uh, usage fees, I think. We, uh, we do very, very well. I think we're probably below peer as far as what we charge. Your recommendations, I think, is I'm not quoting you exactly, but paraphrasing that um, we almost need a perfect storm, a perfect weather season, everything fall into place for us to be profitable year in and year out. Is that a safe, accurate. safe uh, statement? 
That's accurate. I mean, it's, it's great to have low fees. Um, the problem is that if those fees aren't generating enough reserves to improve the facility, uh, and frankly, it's touch and go at times whether we even have enough for general maintenance. You know, a good example would be the, the clubhouse where it sat for a couple of years where it really needed a paint job, and we had town residents coming to me and saying, you know, this building is an eyesore, and, yeah. Yeah. You know, but we didn't have the funds to do it at the time. So, you know, I think we do need to generate uh, some more revenue, and I think with the comparisons that we did, um, you know, it's not as easy to benchmark uh, with golf courses because they're all very different. But we did comparisons as far as uh, overall expenses and, um, and as well as our fees. And we were definitely uh, low on our fees and low on our expenses as well. Would you see yourself uh, coming back prior to the next season, asking the town administrator to maybe relook those fees schedule, ask us to relook at a... Yeah, I, I, I've made some proposed yeah. rates, and certainly it would be nice to you know, to move forward on that. Normally I've already got mailers out to the, um, the season pass people and so on and getting some revenue coming in. Um, um, but yes, I, I definitely think that we're in need of some increases and even with the increases, we will still be lower than everybody else, you know, with the increases. So that's something we, we can expect, I guess. Yeah, and I, I did break out some, some of these fees uh, in, a, in a different way, uh, memberships, I've written down some, you know, what is the weekly cost of a membership? And we've proposed some new memberships, like junior, a junior membership, which we've never had. Uh -huh. um, but sometimes when you look at it in that way, you say, geez, that really is a good deal. You know, yeah. it's like a junior membership proposed at $400 for the year is like $10.50 a week. And That's a good deal. It is a good deal when you look at it that yeah. way. Um, and, and the others, I mean, even, you know, like the senior membership is $20 a week. Um, you don't have to play a lot of golf to get your money's worth out of that. No, no. Um, and even our, even our <coughs> greens fees that, that you don't see in the comparison, um, a situate resident and only a situate resident can purchase a frequent player card. So anyone that plays a fair amount of golf is going to play at least six rounds of golf can prepay five greens fees and get a card for six, which takes their cost per round down by about 17%. So even in looking at these rates, which are favorable to the others, um, they actually would even go down more if people take advantage of these type of programs. Now we have such a great facility up there and, and, and people uh, praise it all the time. It's, it's uh, you know, probably time we looked at the fees and. Well, I think it's the best. It's, I really think right now it's as good as it's ever been. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's credit to the IGM crew that's in there right now is doing an exceptional yeah. job for us. You know, it's a, pri it's a, it's a public course, unlike uh, the Country Club of Brookline. You know, it's a, it's a public course, and it has players of all uh, caliber, I should I put, you know, some who are a lot more cautious of uh, course maintenance than others. Uh, you know, it doesn't usually... You don't see that in a, in a private course too much. Uh, you see everyone trying to maintain their course, but in a public course, people have a little, a little uh, less concern about how they leave the course. But I think it's in just great shape, great shape. Comments from the board? Two, um, you know, Bob, um, a lot of people talk about how the, um, the course and its um, the difficulty and, and how it would be nice to, to try to lessen it. I'm going to tell you right now, not that you would change it, it shouldn't. That's what makes this course so unique. A lot of people talk about it. The, everybody goes around and says, look, it's a lynx. It's, it's beautiful, the surroundings. And yeah, it's, it may be difficult for some people, the hackers, and I'm one of them. But I mean, the reality of it is it makes it challenging. Tony's you want to go back to it. <laughs> Tony, you're not supposed to be nodding your head. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is that it shouldn't. That's what makes the course <coughs> appealable. More and more people see it as a challenge. You go back and you want to keep doing it. If you master it, and if you're a hacker like me, you go on to the next course, and, and I, I think that's commendable. Uh, your stewardship and management of it has is, is, is been exceptional. The second thing is the proposal about increasing the fees, I would assume, are somewhat of a short-term measure for now, yeah, whether it's this year, next year, maybe two or three years. But I would think a long-term goal would be 
you could continue to increase the fees to try to, shall we say, elevate to try to maxim or um, equalize some of the potential offset that you could get from bad weather. But am I wrong to assume that, you know, a better clubhouse in the future along that lines to try to bring in more revenue, not necessarily from a golfing perspective, but some form of, like, rental and, you know, um, 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 it's it is one of the uh, one of the goals actually yeah. was the long term goal as far as um, looking with Tricia into um, clubhouse improvements um, curb appeal in general I mean the um, entrance to in the parking lot um, now, the sign was actually excellent the new improvement by uh, Cox to sign was much better than the old sign I will say it's better small subtle change but it does make a bit of a difference but there is some room for improvement certainly if we were able to generate some reasonable reserves and those are the type of things that we could look at and um, and I think it would certainly help uh, certainly would help to be able to uh, attract some outings because a lot of our outings outing calls just end with the fact that they can't do everything on site yeah and they don't really want to get in their cars and leave so right. uh, the majority of our calls go away because of that so certainly if uh, there are some plans uh, to expand the, um, the clubhouse building that I don't think would be terribly costly and I think it would allow us to be able to feed a full field shotgun start. John? That, we do have a set of plans right from the beginning. That's is just the first phase of it, isn't it, We John? do have some plans somewhere. Um, yeah. But, it, but would it be a major renovation? Is that what you're talking about, something not quite as big? I don't think it's major. I think it's a matter of enclosing the deck area and then, and then adding a deck area on, which would actually um, hide some of your back of the house, washing the carts and that type right. of thing would be right. kind of undercover. Right. Um, so it would actually help that re in that regard as well. Um, and probably a relocation of the bathroom. Yeah. yeah, the yeah, bathroom yeah. facilities are very inadequate as it is. It's a great view of the uh, North River. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, just, just, yep. one, just one comment, and without getting into too much detail, you talked about the fees, and I know I agree with John. It's you know probably more on the short term goal, but keep in mind the juniors. I just think, you know, it's a great you know opportunity for the young boys and girls to go out, spend a half a day, you know, all our kids are going to be doing it. You know, if they're not doing it already, and they're not using cots, that sort of stuff. Just keep that in mind. That yeah, is, we, that's all. I just we have an awful lot of junior play out there, and the, one of the reasons we do is, if you look at the cost comparisons, our junior rates probably the um, the lowest of all of them relative to other facilities. What's the age uh, to be qualified? Goes up to 17. So if you reduce it to 15, sucker them in from 12 to 15, and then have them pay after. <laughs> 59. Are we doing the high school again this year? Oh, I think that's going to be forever. Forever, I it's believe. Great. It's a great, okay. uh, a great opportunity, I think, for the town. I think that's when, you know, when the when the course was originally built, you know, it was things like that 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 were in, our, in, in people's minds. You know, that the high school team would be able to play there. That that there'd be a great junior program, senior program, etc. All those things. If I may, just I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Yeah, just a yep. couple yep. things. I, um, I, when I went through your goals, in fact, Sean and Joe both mentioned it. You know, I think that the kids program and the tournaments are two things that really, you know, should be focused on in the in the goals there. I know that that they're there. I mean, I was surprised that they weren't actually written here. I know you do do. And my son plays a lot of golf up there, and we've met for years, knowing that per tournament play is where the money comes from when you can get a hundred people on a golf course you know it, it adds a lot to the revenue side of things um, but I don't know if you can expand the kids offerings to get more of them out there or get some sort of more organization whether it's a league or a um, you know I, I know there's lessons and programs and stuff and it's good but I didn't know if there's any expansion capabilities on that we actually did have that some years ago and it just seemed like the kids were pulled in too many directions I mean what I had was I had a competitive league and I actually tried to even call some of the uh, surrounding towns to have like a travel team and I couldn't get any interest there so we did our own internal and uh, you know we just called it the Junior Ryder Cup and the kids would compete against each other different formats each week and so on um, and I did it more for the type of the kids that would be eventually trying out for the high school team but um, 
we did it for three or four years, and it just um, it just didn't work that well. Yeah. Uh, Rockland has a very good. I'm sure you're aware of it. They have a really good program in the summer where, whatever it's Wednesday afternoons, and they get, you know, 50, 60, 70 kids out there to play, um, and it, you know, this is just a growing population of those, you know, 10 to probably even younger, eight or nine to 13 year old. Um, you know, that'd be something to look into. Um, the other thing I um, circled in here, I, I did, I, I do differ in John's opinion a little bit on the, the difficulty of the course and whether that's good or bad. Um, personally, it raises my score a little bit, but, but we've talked about this in the past. Um, the, you know, there's certain areas where you know that there's a bottleneck, and no one likes to go out and play a six hour round of golf. And I know you guys do a great job pushing people around, but is that is that simply a financial matter where you know that on the seventh hole that everybody hits it in the water and it takes too much time over um, to do it, and and if you could, you'd you'd lay that out differently, or is well, they've tried to soften as much as they can. Um, one area that he's a little resistant to soften it is with the heather grass, basically the fescue that grows mm -hmm. tall in some areas. He feels like that that's the look that the course should have. And for somebody who has trouble with those force carries, you know, so if you, supposing you got a force carry of 100 yards to get over that, um, he, he feels, and I kind of agree with him, that it would kind of ruin the appearance of the golf course to take that grass away, make it easier for people to find their ball. I think a better solution would be to encourage these people to play from the proper set of tees and and, uh, and make it a little bit easier to, to get over these obstacles. Uh, or just paint them differently. But, you know, environmental issues, uh, you know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm thinking things. that, you know, I know occasionally you'll play and it does get backed up because it, it is a difficult course. I think we'd all agree mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, if you made it easier, would, would you think it would get more play or no? Oh, definitely. I, I think um, as far as return customers, I would say it's our biggest drawback. Um, you know, it's just too difficult a golf course for some people to enjoy on a daily basis. Uh, we've gotten a, quite a loyal following now, so, and we certainly, you know, we have people that like that challenge. And frankly, the only way that you could make it considerably easier would probably make the golf course dangerous because you'd cut some trees out between fairways and next thing you know it's like a shooting gallery yeah so but if it's if you say it's the number one reason why people to come back and play again then it's certainly something to consider i, I imagine you could probably say well the the tee shot on three is difficult you know you hit it to the right and it's gone yeah um you know and there's maybe ways that if you had money you could soften it a little bit in certain areas? Well, a big problem really was the the site was only 100 acres for a yeah. golf course. Most 18-hole golf courses are built on 150 acres. Yeah. So because of that, you know, he was very limited as to what he could do, and I think he did a, I think he did an incredible job with what he had to work with. No, no, I'm not, it's a great course and it's challenging. I'm just saying if it's the number one reason why people don't come back again, then maybe it should be. Yeah. As I say, I think as much as you tried to soften the golf course, as much as you tried to, I, I would have to say that it still would probably be the number one reason that we don't get as many return <laughs> visitors as we'd like to. But you tend to lose, and, and this is where I go. You know, either you walk onto the course with like 24 balls, prepared to lose 24 balls, or those people aren't coming back, those hackers aren't coming back to play because they don't want to lose their ball. And they spend too much time looking for their balls all over the place. But I, I think you. you you got to keep one thing in mind. It has been softened it has, considerably yeah. over the years. It if you has. go back to the to the first year or two that that course was in existence, that was a, <laughs> ch a challenge. Is not the right word. It was it was uh, it's been softened considerably. How much you can soften it, I don't know. You know. And, couple, and, go ahead. Yeah, go a on. couple of the, on repairs and maintenance. It's dropping. You know, it's dropped from 43 to 23 to 18. What, what is that? Does that have to do with the carts, or is that? Um, I think part of that was a, a number of um, course improvements that uh, were done. Like, I think the painting and the, they put, um, they put that 
special board on one side of the clubhouse. Uh, they, they did some paving improvements out there on number seven. There were a lot of those type of things uh, that year. Also, so this budget item is really miscellaneous repair to the grounds. Like everything, the new, the new that fence. was carts and everything. But, but in, the, in that particular year, there were a number of improvement projects. Okay. Uh, Peter Spencer, I know, did one, and, and uh, you know, the clubhouse was done. Um, so we, it just was a big year for that in that particular year that you're, you're focusing okay. on. Now, the management fee, that's a three-year contract. Is that correct? Five. It's a five-year contract? And when is that? <coughs> well, this is the first year of it now. Oh, so well, we just signed a new one. Food and beverage and the maintenance are new as of July 1, 2009. Okay. Um, the other thing that, that concerned me in the budget is the marketing. We, we allocate $6,000 to marketing, and I know we've talked about this in some meetings in the past. We haven't spent any this year, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what we need to do to get some sort of formalized marketing plan because obviously our revenue's been dropping every year, and I don't know if we can draw them in by some sort of media. I know we used to do things on, on radio, a few radio spots in the past. Um, you said you do some flyers out to people. I don't know if you actually need somebody, like a marketing person, to come in to say, or a collaborative thing with other golf courses. Um, but that's been something that's been, you know, we talked about. We haven't, coincidentally enough, uh, Jane Fallon, who's here tonight, brought that very subject up uh, this afternoon uh, about a possible. <coughs> Jane, go ahead, why don't you? I'm not going to speak for you. I just think that, well, I'm runs the golf course, does a beautiful job, but he can't do everything. So that if we want to increase our tournament play, or even just the general people going to the course, if we could have a marketing person that could get a flyer out, and we could like get to the South Shore Chamber of Commerce, a list of the businesses on the South Shore that might do golf tournaments. And I know that we spoke <coughs> to Dana Child from mm -hmm. Hingham yep. on the South Shore Country Club, and they have done a lot of improvements to that course, but they have also built up more revenue. So I think if we start somewhere that we couldn't, in, you know, we'd be lucky and say we double the amount of tournaments or something. We've talked about that. I mean, the turn they have the benefit of having the place to have the, the function yeah, afterwards, and yeah. that's, as Bob said, is our big deterrent. Um, but somehow, if there was a marketing plan, you know, in some sort of, you know, if you need to spend half that on a consultant to figure out what. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very indifferent about marketing. Um, I know that in the early years, we needed to, you know, we had like a $40,000 marketing budget, and you know, we hit the Boston papers, and it's, it's, a, it's very, very expensive. Um, I've been trying to do more internally and do it more from word of mouth and try to get the saving back to the customers. So to put on the bulletin board as soon as you're walking in, uh, you know, advertise some of our daily specials. Um, so that if somebody comes, and it can be a win-win situation. You know, generally we market those daily specials for a period when we have trouble filling the golf course. Now, if somebody's price sensitive and they say, geez, I can save $12 if I come an hour earlier than I normally come, then it gets them there to fill those spots and then you're gonna be, have a better chance to fill the spot that they would have normally taken. Um, so we've done a little bit more of that. Uh, I mean, I must say that the radio advertisement, you must be talking about EEI, which is probably our best demographic group and I didn't really find that it gave us much bang for the buck there. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know when we did it, but, but, you know, we're trying to get new users and new tournaments in there. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not a marketing person, so I don't know how you get these people out there. But, but we do have a little bit of money allocated to it that, um, you know, it may make sense to. And the only place I might differ is, is I know that it always comes up tournaments, tournaments, tournaments. And first of all, I think it's hard for us to attract the tournaments because they can't do everything under one roof, basically. But to be quite honest with you, I think that if you looked at, let's just take a, a normal Friday in June, and if you just took a look at a normal daily operation, what we will generate in greens fees and cart revenue, and then you take a, 
outing day, I don't think you'd find much of a difference. The only, in fact, I think on a lot of those days, we'll do more in greens, fees, and carts just with normal play. Um, the only time that we would benefit for sure would be if it's like a rainy day, and then the outing would still go ahead and play. Or a Monday. Well, it, yeah, it could, it could be, mean, and particularly if the outing is done in the morning, if, I, if an outing is in the afternoon. I think, you know, as you're looking around at different courses, I mean, it's, it's and we could probably have, I think we probably have had this discussion, but uh, outings are a, a, appear to be a great source of revenue for, for courses. Now, I, I grant that I'm well aware that we don't have the facility right now to, 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 to attract all of these, but there are some golf courses new ones, Pine Hills is a good example. You know, they, I don't think you can find a day down there in the week they don't have a, 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 a tournament. I'm not suggesting that at all, but, but uh, it's a big source of revenue, and I think uh, maybe, maybe marketing, maybe if we brought in a uh, volunteer of some sort to, to find out over the last 10 years who's played at our course, what organizations, uh, and see how many are still there and how many have gone other places or why they've gone. Maybe we can get some of them back. You know, we're always going to get some of them. We're always going to get a, a solid ones here in town that, that uh, you know, aren't going out of town, the local, the animal shelter and the different charity tournaments. But I bet you if we ever looked at the last 10 years and see how many we lost, try to get a handle on why we lost them. And if it is a, just a case of no dinner, you know, then we address that problem. But if not, maybe we could get some of them back. I think it's a, it may make the difference, this is my humble opinion, between being on the edge, breaking even, and putting us over the top where we can do that capital, we can fix the parking lots, for example, you know. May not, but it's just my thought. Yeah, I, I would say to Joe, Joe's point, initially, Joe, when you're saying it, I was, I was thinking about it, um, <clears throat> I think by being able to go back and take a look at the past it will give us an idea of why, if there are groups, uh, associations that are no longer going forward with some form of outing, if it's due to the facilities in the club, that would be very valuable. I mean, obviously in 2017, the bonds paid off on the golf course. Town can take a look at the clubhouse and, and, and the golf course as a whole and say, okay, how's this going to make it profitable? In the short term, your, your suggestion of raising fees, whether it's for juniors to some extent or, as I suggested, kind of in a tongue-in-cheek, tongue in cheek, raise it to 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds. That's, that's a short-term gap issue, but it's going to be the long-term issue. And... Obviously, if it's a clubhouse issue, I think that makes sense. Let's take a look at that. Um, I'm concerned because obviously we're going through a financial situation. It's a crisis in the past two years. There have been a huge um, expansion of golf courses all over the state. And, you know, frankly, a lot of those golf courses, and I say a lot, maybe a large minority, are going to ultimately fall. This one will not. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's publicly owned. It's the town's. It's a great golf course. And um, it will still be here. Um, come 2017. However, um, I think trying to figure out if there's some ways of trying to generate revenue, whether it's through outings or, Bob, as you say, maybe outings are things of the past. You know, a lot of charities or associations are saying we're going to do this, and the reality is they're just maxed out because there's so many golf courses that are doing it. It may be the best thing to do is to focus on the green fees. Um, certainly a continued study of that is important. We're in a state of flux right now, so we got to figure out maybe it is green fees versus the outings. Um, as an aside, and please don't take this the wrong way, um, with the uh, zoning bylaws we've been looking at, and, and of course one of the things I came across was miniature golf. Bob, again, um, the, the, the thing is our bylaws preclude it in the town of Situate altogether. So if anybody wants to go play miniature golf for kids and everything else, you got to go outside of the town. So obviously we're, we're suggesting the bylaws look. If somebody wants to put it in, fair enough. My thought was in the golf course, if there's any public land to be able to tack on something for kids. Again, starting young with kids, golfing, they have the chance to go to the, uh, uh, the golf range, getting juniors involved. Again, it, it's a town operated that the town could generate revenue. Maybe that's something, but I don't mean to insult anything because this is a, you know, you're a professional, it's a professional golf course. That's what we're striving towards. But if it generates revenue, that's something that would be certainly helpful if you can tack on a, a little acre with a little putt-putt or whatever. But um, again, that's a separate issue. But um, 
again, I, I, I just think that studying it's great. I don't know whether it's $6,000 worth of marketing is going to do anything this year because, frankly, people are cutting back, businesses are cutting back, the economy is not looking good. So, you know, whether you put it on EEI or you put it on WBZ or whether you put it in the local newspapers, I don't know how many people are looking at advertisements in the local newspapers because newspapers aren't getting bought. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. I always have trouble with those windmill holes. <laughs> That's, that's, that's just it's my Don problem. Don Quixote, you know? That's just my problem, I guess. <laughs> Anything else from the board? I, I just noticed yep. that this year we're, we're below last year's numbers. And do you think that's predominantly because of the weather? Absolutely. October was was very behind. and Yeah, October, we actually did fairly well in the other months, but we got, no, we got, yeah, we got killed in October because we lost uh, a lot of weekends. Yeah. Actually, we lost a lot of weekends in September as well, but we still had pretty good numbers in September. Um, yeah, we exceeded the prior year. So, so what do you? I mean, just in something in conclusion here, what do you think the trend of the revenue going down? What do you think the stopgap is to get that turn around in the other direction? Like, what is what is your plan? And I don't need it now, but maybe that's what we need to do. Here are the here are the four things that I think we need to do to reverse this trend of declining users I mean well or is it the industry in general I don't think I don't think we've got a decline in, in users really I think the course has been very busy on the on the decent weather days I just think that this without a doubt was the worst weather year from I'm talking in a calendar year mm -hmm. from for the calendar year without a doubt in the 13 years it was the worst weather year and I thought we didn't get killed as bad as I would have expected to I thought we did all right. I thought we were fairly busy on our, on our good days, and I think the specials have worked out very well. My biggest concern is that I think the people that come to play the golf course, you, you can't imagine how many people come up to the counter when we say it's $56 or whatever. Oh, geez, that's, that's great, you know. We get a lot of comments like that. Our prices are, are very good, very attractive. <coughs> My feeling is that we would... We would lose more people if all of a sudden we don't have decent um, reserves to put back into the golf course. And then all of a sudden, like right now, uh, we are in need of a fairway mower for at the tune of like $55,000. He's still using the original fairway mower. And we've put that off for a year. Now, you know, that could impact the quality of the fairways and things. I think the users would be willing to pay a little bit more money as long as their, you know, their facility was staying up to par. You but know. that, I mean, that's my whole point. For the last seven years, this operation has been teetering on the break-even line because of the weather. Well, the weather is the only thing we know is going to be consistent. It's going to be consistently inconsistent. You know, it's going to, we don't know what it's going to be. But we, we don't have any cushion there to say, you know, that we do have reserves to buy a new mower because we're always right on the brink there in terms of our expenses and in terms, and you run a very, very tight operation. I mean, we've gone through the expenses. There's no fat in there. Um, so it's all revenue driven. And I don't know what what the plan is to get two or $300,000 more of revenue in there so that you can buy that new mower and so that you can change that hole if you wanted to, so that you can, I don't know that raising the fees is gonna, $5 is gonna do that. Well, I mean, I think it would uh, do a decent job of it. I think it would have a better chance than outings, to be quite honest with you. We just, right now, we don't have the facility. I, see, when I say that we lose a lot of our calls, I, I get the calls always and interested in an outing, and when you tell them that we wouldn't be able to feed that many people, we lose the majority of our calls right there. Yeah, uh, but they can go to Situa Country Club. Yeah, they do. They can. Oh, yeah, no, we... I mean, they can play here and drive across the street. Yeah, they prefer not... I mean, yeah. I just think that a lot of people don't prefer to do that right. type of thing. But do we push that? I mean, do we suggest that to people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because I think Tony's right on. I think I think a combination a combination of, of, of raising the fees and also uh, increasing our uh, tournament play might be, you know, help us reach that number we're looking at. I Would recommend say, Barker's and, you know, I, I certainly yeah. I recommend all of the yeah. facilities that have banquet. But even if we had a, some sort of a, uh, I don't know if you use the word deal, but a program that uh, 
tied in with the one of the I won't get into which one it should be. Maybe we can make it more attractive. Maybe if the if, if the restaurant was willing to to uh, be a little more aggressive in their pricing, if we sent them 150 people on a Monday afternoon, I you know. You're talking to a country club or, uh, or some, whatever. Or the yeah, yeah right. whatever the back or, or whatever. Even, uh, the, beaches, I don't know if any place. I mean. I mean, they're more, you know, I mean, Situa Country Club is, is always glad to get that business. I know. Yeah. 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 Do we get anything back currently? No, no, no. but we, you know, we, we get, get that out. We get the you tournament. Get home, we right. get yeah. the so tournament. I'm kind of, you know, it works because the, the Situa Country Club is not a, you know, only a nine-hole golf course. They can't take a large number of golfers, and we don't have the restaurant space to feed them. So but they do. It so. kind of, it works kind of nicely. But um, but, but keep, keep in mind, as Bob alluded to a little while ago, not to get into the nitty-gritty of it, but a, a shotgun sat at noon or one o'clock. What time do you have to shut the course down? Yeah. You, you let your last golfer go out at what nine thirty, nine o'clock, whatever. Well, it they might gotta be off the course. I mean, the right. shotgun starts are at one o'clock, right? Which means that to play eighteen holes and get the cart back and turn it around and everything, they got to be done by twelve thirty. That means yeah. eight o'clock. Right. Now that scenario, that's why we try to do away with afternoon starts right. because it pretty much kills the whole day. That's what I do think, and I think what I'm hearing here anyway, that, you know, do we, we have to do something, and, and raising the fees isn't the absolute ideal thing to do because you're probably, you know, there's a certain percentage you'll lose, although I, I, don't, I think that percentage is very small. Chasing uh, charity <coughs> tournaments probably isn't the most ideal thing either, but we're at a stage now where we have to, I think, Look at everything to get to that stage where we can buy that that fairway mower. We we, we can fix the parking lot. Where we can do this or that. I think yeah. that's what I'm saying. If there was, yeah. I'd love to see a list of here's five, six, ten things that we're going to try this year to try and get the number back up to the four, almost one and a half million dollars that we had in '07. Because then you got then you're throwing off some revenue to the reserves that you can do stuff with. You know, right now your your hands are tied. I think in terms of. Um, but, and I did look at all this, and I really feel like the easiest way to do it, as they say, even with these price increases, we still, there won't be any place well, that the they can Well, the price increase will cheaper. be one of them, but there's yep. got to be eight, there's got to be seven others underneath it where we can say, yes, we're going to market that, you know. I just think that you're, you're dealing with really a function of the financial times of excess spending, and people, you know, I mean, Bob, you're right, you're the cheapest among a lot of the surrounding courses, and it's a great course, and I just think... There are less people, and we can try a lot. I mean, that's why I think we need to study it. Um, I just think it's a function of the times. People are saying, hey, look, I'm not going to spend six hours in playing golf and spending $100 between a car cart and, and the fees to go play, and they're using it elsewhere. I think that's part of the problem that we're looking at, and, and this is an unusual time. We haven't seen it in the past 15 years, 20 years. I, 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 I mean, hearing all this, I mean, I'm sitting here playing devil's advocate and saying, I don't know whether that's going to do any good. I think raising fees is helpful because I'd rather see the fees generated to buy the mower to make the greens efficient. With all due respect, I don't want to see it coming out of our budget because, frankly, what if it doesn't? Then we're taking money out of the budget to continue to pay for something that doesn't generate any funds. And I, I think I'd rather push it onto the the user, so, so to speak, a user fee. And I think that makes sense. I just, I don't know. I think we're just, studies are helpful. I normally would say they're a waste of time. <laughs> Usually they are, but we're dealing with a situation where, you know, we have an enterprise fund, a golf course, to try to generate funds, you know, and I think it's a finance, it's a, a, the use that we're using is an excess use. It's a use that when times are well, people use it, and when it's not, people are going to say, I'm not going to go spend the, the money at the golf course. I'll spend it on my what have you, my, my, my credit cards or my, my, my mortgage payment or my or what, you know, other things. I, 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 I don't know, say, though, it's hard to say. That what I have found with the bad economy, and I was afraid coming into this year that we were gonna finally see the economy catch up with us and maybe people would just have to make the hard choice not to play golf at all, but when the economy started to sour, I think that it hurt Pine Hills and Waverly Oaks, the high end. Yeah, you're right. And it drove a lot of those people to us. So I almost thought that it was helping us, uh, if, you know. And I think this year I was pleasantly surprised that I, I as I say, I thought, okay, maybe this is going to be the year where we really will see the effect of it. And I didn't. It was really this year. It was just one thing. It was weather. I mean, it was just lousy. I mean, I mean, I never expect much in April and May, 
this year June was just as bad as any May would be, and and then we had we had terrible uh, weekends to finish the year. So, uh, you know, I I think. Uh, and the golf course, I'm going to tell you, the product that we have right now is the best it's ever been. So if there's ever a time to, you know, be able to get people to accept any, a little bit of a hike in price and, and try to get a little more revenue coming I don't, through. I don't think you're hearing any, you know, uh, negatives on that. I think everyone feels that we'll be seeing you again sometime in the late winter, early spring about a, a price increase. I think what I'm hearing here, I think, is... By all means, look into that, and we expect that. Also, look into this, any other ways we can just increase it. When the, when the day comes, we get the bond paid off, and we're at three or four hundred thousand dollars for the good there. We may not have this problem, but until then, you know, I think just take a look at those tournament situations, take a look at the marketing, you know, take a look at the fees, and you know best. You know a lot better than we do, so. Just to list it, here's what we're going here's here's, here's yeah. to try. try and feel we want. I mean, we know that raising the freeze is not going to increase the number of users. It may increase our revenue, but it's yeah. not going to increase the number of users. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a plan B that says, here's how we're going to try and increase users by doing whatever. Yeah. You know? I, think, I think that's, you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, the budget that's recommended before you um, is predicated on the fee increase just to break even for yep. FY11, and we've delayed the capital purchase. And the way the bond structure, since we refinanced it, is set up, it's all, it's got a balloon pavement in the out years, which um, we need to look at. There's a bunch of additional financial information that you have um, in terms of the revenue side, in terms of if it breaks down what we're getting in the pro shop, what we're getting for greens fees and stuff like that. But um, I think definitely we can find out the, the clubhouse limitations in terms of the bigger tournaments are a real issue. And the marketing, I think, is definitely something that I know I've talked to Bob about um, in terms of <coughs> new users. Um, the revenue is at its price point right now for the users that will come all the time. Um, and that will, the fee increase will keep us even, but we need to increase the number of users through yep. marketing. And, you know, the limitations of the clubhouse are capital, obviously, and we need to start to look at that. Between now and, right. and, and April. One question from the floor, a comment, Ann? Um, in terms of bargaining, since we now have the end of Central Park, and it's now going to be for many years, some type of a junket, using the train, mm -hmm. coming to the event, golf, that's a marketing aspect that you might want to look at. Also, to I was involved with the permitting process in the mid-90s when this golf course came forward and was told, because I felt very strongly at that time, that there would be, after three years, a new function hall, a clubhouse, and we're still waiting. And I think you all alluded to it this evening. We're really not going to get any further than we already are if we can in some way, somehow, come up with a viable function hall. We have the best view on the South Shore that we should be capitalizing on. Yep. I don't know where the money would come from, whether it was a lease or something, should be done to maximize what is really a gem. Couldn't agree with you more. We need a clubhouse where the money comes from. That's the, the big question. All right. Uh, we can be here. I think it's a great topic. And, and uh, thank you, Bob, for... Thank, Bob, you. Don't take, thank you for engaging us. I mean, I hope the <laughs> first time is not your last. Let's hope that. <laughs> that finishes the budget process uh, for tonight. Uh, certainly not going to repeat what, what's been said, what Tony said, and others. This is this was fantastic for us. I hope it's I hope it's uh, enlightening for department heads uh, and everybody else. It's just been a uh, we recognize a ton of work for everybody. Uh, but it looks like it pays off as far as we're concerned, it does anyway. So. All right. Open to the April 2010 town meeting. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to open the April 2, uh, April 12, 2010 annual town meeting at 8.49 p.m. Second. Uh, all in favor? Open the warrant, right? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. It's done. It's opened. Uh, annual license renewals. 
Moved that the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the following liquor license for the year 2010. Cosmos Cafe, the Gannet Grill, Situate Country Club, Situate Racket and Fitness, TK, TK O'Malley Sports Cafe, Oro Restaurant. Second. Uh, for discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Next. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the following common, uh, common vicular's license for 2010. Cosmos Cafe, Gannett Grill, Citric Country Club, Citric Racket and Fitness, TK O'Malley Sports Cafe, Wilbur's North. Second. Uh, discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, it's unanimous. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the following entertainment licenses for 2010. The Gannett Grill, Citroen Country Club, and T.K. O'Malley Sports Cafe. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's uh, unanimous. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the inn holder's license for the inn at Citroen Harbor for 2010. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Abstain. 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 One abstention. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the following Class Two licenses for 2010. Automotive Depot, Inc., James Donovan, and Driftway Auto. Second. Uh, discussion, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? It's unanimous. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the Hawker's Peddler's License for Lisa Talbot, DBA Something Sweet for 2010. Second. Uh, discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. My understanding is, Kim, on the 29th or 8th, okay. we may have... The remainder of the licenses to be renewed, just a few. Right. Okay. Is that our next meeting? That's the next meeting. You may be away. People may be away. It's, it's hopefully going to be a very short meeting. And, and Are we doing uh, budget? Just uh, Niels. Just Niels? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I think Rick's back, so. Yeah, he'll be back then, so. Um, okay. I hope so. All right. Um, Next is the appointments. This is the appointments to the to the seawall committee. The response to this has been somewhat overwhelming, uh, in that people have, have volunteered to 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 come forward and work on this project. As, as you remember, it would be a committee reporting to uh, Kevin Cafferty of DPW, um, and they would just look at condition of the seawall. Most important, the funding. You know, funding, as we've heard all night tonight, is, is so major. Uh, the funding of, of how to how to fund the repairs that are so necessary for the seawalls. We, we're a, we're a coastal community. Seawalls are vital to our to our very existence. Uh, certainly, the neighborhoods we see that down at Sand Hills and other places. So, this committee could be invaluable. We've had 11 uh, applicants. They've all showed an interest. I, you know, my, my thought is that we can use every one of them. They all have different uh, expertise. Some of them have volunteered. If necessary, they would be uh, associate members because it doesn't, you know, there's not going to be a lot of votes taken, so it doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference whether you're an associate member or a regular member. Uh, and I have circled here four names that are, that are well, let me ask the board. Do you want 11 members? Or? Well, well, I guess I'm under the impression. I initially thought we were voting today to create the the commission, if that's the uh, the committee. Yep. Um, and I see that we have 11, which is great. I know that people have expressed an interest. I told them to hold off until we actually create that committee, and and so I I, I now see that we have 11 people. And I've just is this is this group of people going to be the shall we say sum total? Because I would rather hold off on voting because those people haven't had an opportunity to put their applications in before. So I would say, if that's the case, fine. If we're going to make this committee kind of an open-ended committee and then everybody's involved, then I'd, I'm fine to, to vote on these, providing we have that. So I guess I'm kind of, if that's the, if the will of the board is to say, let's go move on this, I would say, no, I'd have to hold off. Let's create the committee and then let's get the sum total of all the applicants and give them one more opportunity to submit. Uh, well, otherwise, I'd can say- Can we decide how much, you know, I think you have to have a, Obviously, an odd number of people in a a smaller voting number. Otherwise, it yeah. gets unmanageable. Yeah. I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of votes taken. Right. I but mean, it's, it's it's you know you're going to be seeking funds. But I understand what you're saying. So, do you want to have like five a five member committee and everyone else can be an associate member? I was 
I was, I was thinking well, seven, but seven. Seven probably would be better because, you know, it's like anything. Some people can't make it, and then now oh, you're down at three if two are missing. And Can the associates vote? I'm sorry. No. Well, if you have associates, no. All right. I, 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 don't I mean, you, you've got uh, – yeah, I agree with Joe. It's just going to be a, somewhat of a informational committee that's going to pass on findings to, you know, to Al and to Kevin. You know, you've got people who have abutters. You have um, – construction engineers, residents, you have a pretty good background. I'd, I'd hate to, you know, put, some, put someone on as an associate that wouldn't be able to add as much as someone else. That's I think an associate will be able to well, have the exact same strength on the committee as a regular member. I just don't see it. Uh, it's not like a... I have no problems voting with numbers. I'm just saying that if we're, we're limiting it to 11 people, I'd... I'd I can't, uh, you know, my, my thought is because, as I said, there are people who had made comments, and I didn't tell them put their application, and I said hold off because we were going right, to be creating But I'd be inclined to say, if fine, let's. If you have people out there, John, who want to volunteer, we'll put it off for two weeks. Is that fair? No, I'm happy, Joe, to vote on it. I'm just saying that if you want to go with numbers and vote for it, I, I, I'm just trying to say, is, is this the inclusive committee? If it's inclusive, then I'd say, yeah, then put it off. If it's, if it's open-ended and you have a number of associates, which basically are volunteers, then... I'm yeah, happy to vote I mean, on I'm it. Certainly I'm not, not going to vote against anybody. It. No, I'm not either. I mean, no, I'm not either. Way, well, it's, it's, um, why, don't we, why don't we vote to form the committee with seven voting members tonight and okay. then give it two weeks and then you guys pick the seven members? How's that? That's fine. Right, with and that. everyone else will be associated. That's fine. Okay. That's okay. Fine. That's fair enough. Sure. Kim? And maybe we can get it in the press that if you're interested, it'll be. And we have to vote for beautification. Okay. Yes. Move, move the board of selectmen appoint Leslie Dan Dinell to the Beautification Commission. Second. Uh, further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. That's what we'll do. Put it on for the last meeting of the year. So the 29th. 29th. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other business, Tony. Um, just a couple things. One, uh, after school commission has been getting together and uh, slowly going down that path of trying to figure out how to orchestrate all these commit uh, programs. Um, working on a, a booklet and some guidelines, and um, not much to report yet, other than that it's work moving forward. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say is we had the uh, town Christmas party the other night and it was very well organized and very well attended and the food was great and, and uh, good conversation and good Christmas cheer or holiday cheer. So I want to thank everyone that put that together. Um, and lastly, Community Christmas is uh, going strong and there's a lot of need in our town for support. So anything that anyone can do to uh, <coughs> give time or give gifts or give um, gift cards or what have you, it uh, goes to a great need. Thank you. Sean? Nope, not tonight. John? Briefly, the uh, bylaw review committee met again. They've got one more meeting and then the zoning bylaws um, as proposed by the special uh, bylaw uh, review committee will be coming forward. It will be coming before the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, Advisory and uh, various uh, boards in preparation for town meeting. Um, second, I just wanted to say to uh, Tricia and Al, he's not here, but I noticed that there are, I've seen different crosswalk signs that are obviously popping up. Uh, in various locations, not just downtown or around the schools, but other areas um, that are, f are significant for um, for pedestrians, and I commend the DPW for doing it. Um, third, the um, merchants had their um, first night, so to speak. It was a well-received um, event downtown, both uh, on Front Street and all, as well as in the uh, North Situate, and I, I commend um, the merchants for doing that. Finally, I was going to say I met with um, an um, a number of people from Hadley School, <coughs> along with Kevin Cafferty of the uh, DPW, uh, Jim Campwell, and the um, state concerning sidewalks to Hadley. They're part of a, a special um, um, focus group here in the town of Situate, as well as other communities. And uh, they're along the way towards trying to achieve sidewalks to Hadley School in the most dangerous <coughs> areas. And I have to commend Barbara Leiden and, and a few of the, uh, uh, the teachers. Um, and uh, various neighbors who are trying to push the state into putting them into the most 
um, shall we say, vulnerable locations, whereas the state is trying to put them all over the place, they're trying to achieve the, the, the health and safety for various locations, and in particular, Hollett Street. So it's moving forward. It's a lot slower than it should be, but I will say that um, thanks to their uh, stewardship, it's, it's moving forward. So hopefully in the new year, we'll have some direction on that. And that's it. Correspondence? I don't think there is any. Just the, uh, there is a public notice um, on the um, public health nurse Eileen Scotty will conduct a seasonal flu clinic at St. Mary's Parish Center on Wednesday, December 16th. That's tomorrow between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. This will be administered on a first come, first serve basis and only offered uh, this one day. Um, they will not receive any additional seasonal vaccine this season. So if anybody's watching tonight, please go tomorrow between 10 and 2. The clinics are for seniors, 60 and older, older, adults with chronic medical conditions, and providers of care to high-risk persons in homes. Uh, for additional information, call 781-545-8706. That's the health, uh, Board of Health. And for transportation, call 781-545-8722. John, that's just the regular flu? Yeah. That's just regular. regular Correct. It's not H1N1. Not one. One. It's not the swine flu. Uh, thank you. Uh, minutes, November 5th. Well, the minutes of November 5th, 2008. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Most unanimous. I think the next thing is adjournment. Move to, move to adjourn. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Merry Christmas, folks. Thanks. Merry Christmas to everybody is right. Merry Christmas and happy holidays.